time to be doing scientific analysis on every category, and I'm certainly not as uh, concerned about uh, you know Carignan as a group because we had three Carignans entered last year. We had 55 or 60, uh, what was it, 55 or, or so petite Syrahs. Um, so I, I think uh, petite Syrah is certainly more important as a variety, and it certainly has reached a point of, of uh, broad use with 70, 750 producers. Um, I think that the problems that lead to Petit Syrah's uh, misunderstanding at other competitions is what somebody said, I think it was Clark who said, pick something that puts a smile on your face and give it a gold medal. That is absolutely the antithesis of what we want to do at a wine competition. What we want to do is not say, this is a great wine and I give it a gold medal because I love it. No, we don't want that. What we want is for judges to say, this is a great wine and I give it a gold medal because of the following specifics. And if we can do that, then Petit Syrah's natural greatness rises and it becomes evident. And this is where we are entering the new era. What we're trying to do with the competition at Riverside and, and at Long Beach is to identify standards set up by Clark whether they are precise enough or not will be seen in future years as we go through the system and we will refine it with your help. What we want those parameters to do is to guide the judges in understanding this variety. Is it going to be necessary forever to do this? I hope not. I hope we don't have to do this in 50 years or 30 years. I hope we have judges who are educated properly. The problem with Hodgson's work, in, in my opinion, is that there aren't enough good judges being used at wine competitions. I consider my judges at Riverside to be the best judges in this country. Period. End of story. I, there are better judges that I could get my hands on sometimes, but I can't afford to get them. I've got a limited budget. I can't fly them in from France. But I do have a great, you look on my website, riversidewinecompetition.com, take a look at the names of those judges. I defy you to find one person in there who hasn't got at least 20 years of experience in judging wine properly. And the panels that I set up are all very, very carefully decided. The Riesling panel is made up of four Riesling specialists. The Petit Syrah panel was specifically done with four people in mind, and their names are in, the, in your packet that uh, Clark printed out for you. These people who really understand the variety because they've made the variety. They under, they've grown the variety. You also understand competition, Dan, in that you don't have somebody sitting and tasting 180 acids. We never allow more than 40 wines of a type to be poured for a single panel because it's, it's, it's tiresome and, and your, your mental state fades. So the end result of all of this is not the end, unfortunately. It's the beginning. We're starting this new process and we're starting to see the results of it in how um, the 2008 Christopher Creek uh, Petit Syrah got the sweepstakes award at Riverside. Is it the best wine in the competition? How do you compare apples to oranges or apples to apples when you're saying one is a fruit and one's a computer? Um, the problem that we really have is trying to identify uniqueness, distinctiveness, and reward that. And if that's done, you take the, the pressure off of the judge to say, well, the winner has to be, do you remember those days when a Cabernet was always the sweepstakes winner? you remember those days when a late harvest Riesling was always the sweepstakes winner? Well, we're, we're getting away from that. We've gotten away from that at Riverside. We're getting away from it in many other competitions. I think that the, the real key is how the third era of California wine is evolving. When I talked about Schoonmaker in 1941, he emphasized varietal. By 1966, when Mondavi opened his winery, varietal had taken over the, the generic in terms of volume. It wasn't very long from, from 41 to 66, especially since there weren't very many wineries in those days. And um, by 66, we started seeing varietals taking, taking control. Well, the third era be, has begun. And the third era is probably not visible to most of you, and the reason is that you don't run a wine competition. I do. I remember the days when we'd get 88 or 95 or 117 white Zinfandels. Last year, at, this year at Riverside, we had seven white Zinfandels. So I think that game's over. I think we've, we've run that course on that wine. 
Um, on the other side of it, keep in mind that anything that's sweet and chillable is always going to be in the in the game. So we're going to have some 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 place down the road, and I, I hope it isn't pink Riesling, but that's another story. <laughs> So the next step is the third era. And I wrote about this a month or about three weeks ago in my newsletter. And the third era is blended red. And you all know the reasons why. I don't have to go into the details about what's happening with varietal wine and the surpluses that we're facing and the, and the weakness of the bulk market and all that other stuff. But I came up with a category that I think is valid based upon the gold and silver medals that we saw at Riverside and Long Beach this year in terms of the blended red categories. We're seeing lots and lots and lots of blended reds. We had 88 blended red wines submitted to Riverside this year. In uh, probably 15 years ago, you could have counted on one hand the number of blended reds. And these are not meritage wines. These are not just the Cabernet varieties. These are everything. We have a separate category for meritage. We had like 30 of those. But these 88 wines were all blends of unusual grape varieties, some of which were Tempranillo, Toriga, uh, you name it. It was a, a conglomeration of stuff. And PSB is the next category. You've all heard GSM, Grenache, and Syrah and Mourvedre. This is a very common blend in Australia, GSM or MSG if you are a Chinese food fan. So in, in effect, what we have is the beginning, PSB, Petit Syrah blend. And the reason I say that is the results of Riverside show it. The most uh, metals went to wines that had Petit Syrah blended in. Now we've done this for a long time. We've done this for color reasons. We've done it for uh, backbone reasons. We've done it for flavor reasons. We've done it for a lot of other reasons. We've done it because we didn't want to put out a Petit Syrah as a varietal. What's happening now is we're seeing these blends that are actually coming to the front and actually recognized as great wine because the harmonious flavors all seem to work together. It isn't the, it isn't the days when Louis Martini would, would make a 58% Barbera and call it Barbera on the label because it was legal in those days to say Barbera even though the rest of the wine was Petit Syrah. Barbera was the, the grape on the front of the label, but Petit Syrah was what made the wine. Um, so the question about prejudicing judges comes back, and I'll answer that question. I think with judges who are not overwhelmingly skilled, the, the ultimate is going to be pick a wine that has, puts a smile on your face and give it a gold medal. When you get skilled judges, you can back away from giving them information. But I contend, and I think I'm right, I've been thinking about this for a long time, judging wine by price is an idiot's dream. Where do you draw the line between a low-priced wine and a medium-priced wine? Does it have any relevance at all in the marketplace? It has zero relevance. We're talking about wine quality. Price has nothing to do with wine quality except for the volume of wine made. Does that mean to say you can't make 200,000 cases of a great wine? Well, in some ways, it runs counter to the old thesis that the smaller the tonnage, the better the wine. You've heard that old saw, the smaller the tonnage, the better the wine. Well, that would mean that the best wine is made from a vineyard that gives you no fruit at all. <laughs> Let's think about that for a minute. So answer the question, should we tell judges something about the wine? I believe that in the, in the current context where there is no such thing as a broad base of really high quality judges, where the knowledge base for wine judges is woefully divergent, you need to p provide some guidance. What Clark and I did at Riverside was do part to Clark's diligence in putting together parameters and, and a profile for each of these sub-regions so that we had regional character, which often gives you distinctiveness as a point of quality, not as a point of negativity. In the olden days, in the olden days of 1981, 82, 83, people would disparage uh, Heights Martha's Vineyard, going all the way back to the 70s, even to the late 60s, they would disparage Heights Martha's Vineyard for having that 
Do you remember that word? What was that word? Minty eucalyptus character. Heights, Joe Heights was hated, <clears throat> hated that term because he said it's not a it's not a positive term. It smells like Cabernet from my, my vineyard. It's my vineyard character that counts. <clears throat> In 1976, the Paris tasting proved <clears throat> that the French don't like that character. Heights, Martha's Vineyard, um, 1973, finished dead last. When the um, Vintners Club in San Francisco redid the Paris tasting one year later, the score, the, the, the ranking of the wines was identical with one exception. Heights, Martha's Vineyard, vi Vineyard finished fifth instead of dead last. Why was that? Did the wine change? The judges change, and that was the point. So if we can en enhance the judges' knowledge of something that's concrete, even though it might be divergent, you end up with a distinctive character that is being recognized for its positive qualities. And at that point, we all benefit. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Please catch up with Dan later. He'll be here all day, too, uh, if you have any questions or comments. Uh, we're going to keep on moving here. Uh, we've got still got some great, great more presenters. Um, the next one i um, really excited about. He's a winemaker and a general manager at Stag's Leap Winery. Uh, his career has spanned the industry from everything from sales to winemaking. And uh, his work has taken him to France, Chile, Spain, and Washington. Um, it's my honor from Stag's Leap Winery. Please welcome Mr. Christophe Hobert. And he's he's going to speak, and he has his own mic. <laughs> yeah. You then never know what you are going to do the day after and where you will be. So uh, I was very excited about the fact to make some Petit Tira because naturally I like big wines. And uh, I like Petit Tira because it's very complex, it's very powerful, um, it's very straightforward I would say. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, the, the Petit Tira is like people I like. It gives a person of plenty, gives a lot, very straightforward. I really like uh, this type of wine. And also the, 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 the grape, uh, the variety is kind of a bit crazy. Uh, it is uh, it is particularly vigorous in certain uh, certain circumstances. Um, it it can produce a lot. Uh, last year I have a good example. Um, it was uh, we dropped half of the crop of, of a grower, and um, after that we got the double than what we wanted, and the one was very good. So it was uh, not good because I prefer to, the one would have been better with less crop, but this, this, this grape is really, really unusual. You would do that with a Merlot or Cabernet, the quality would be very, very down, and that doesn't happen with, with, uh, with, with Petit Chira. And uh, some, a year like this year, I, and that's the thing also, when, when I was contacted to, to come and, and talk about Petit Chira, I joined Staglip a year ago, so uh, my first reaction was to tell, I don't want to talk, I have only one harvest behind me. So uh, I, I was feeling I wasn't relevant to talk about Petit Chira, and I realized, because Joe was pushing me, that I was relevant to talk about someone who has only one vintage of Petit Chira. So I can talk about that. And uh, this year, what I see, what has been told, like we see uh, in, in, the, in the field, we see a lot of fasciation. You know, when, when the Petit Chira from one, one uh, shoot, you get three, and where you normally have one cluster, you have still one cluster, but as big as three clusters. So, when you see all of that, it is why I say that I say that the the, the grape the, the variety is a bit is a bit crazy. It's a very unusual and 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 uh, as all winemakers, we like to. 
to play with different things and uh, I, I really enjoy to, to work with that. And I guess that is one of the reasons we, we, uh, we say that we need to tame the, the, the beast because it's really, really, it, it is, and this year is even more very work intensive because the vigor is, is bigger and we have plenty of crop and uh, so it requires lots of work. But the, the, the result is very uh, rewarding. Um, as a winemaker and a red winemaker, my passion is about polyphenols. Uh, anthocyanin uh, and tannins. And uh, the good thing with Petit Tira in the Mapa Valley, I have plenty to work with. The, these wines, they are full of tannins, full of polyphenols, full of anthocyanin. And uh, the, the, there is something I do that not a lot of people do, uh, is to decide when I pick the fruit. Uh, I do what we call polyphenolic maturity. And that matches also with the style of wine I like to make. We were talking about style depending on the place. And I really want something that has a strong identity and two things define identity in a wine. The first one is where is located the vineyard. The second thing is when do you pick. And when you pick for me is very, very important. And it is why I use this polyphenolic maturity. I can try to explain a little how it works. Uh, every three to four days, at the same time we take the, the sample for bricks and, uh, and uh, TAPH, I take another set of sample. The, the, the sample is it's chosen in it's always the same vines that we uh, pick during uh, half variation. These vines are at half variation of the, when, when the block is half variation. These vines are, are variation, and uh, to, the important is to be very consistent. So we take these samples, we ground the the, the fruit completely. It looks like jam. We filter it and we analyze the anthocyanins and the tannins on that. And uh, I, I, uh, I am going to follow the evolution of the, of the anthocyanin. And as long as it is increasing, I wait. And uh, when it is reaching a, a point, a high point or begin to, to decrease, it is when normally I pick. And of course I go to the vineyard to confirm this technique is matching also with the aromas I want. But very often, 90% of the time, it matches. And uh, that I have a very good example of that last year in one of our blocks at Stagli. Uh, first, we started with 1,400 of anthocyanin. So it's just to say it's more than the, be, than the most concentrated Cabernet we had last year. And the uh, viticulturist was telling me, it tastes good, we should, we should harvest, we should pick it. It's, it's, and I was checking that, and uh, the three days after, it was 1,600. I told him, okay, let's wait. The, the, the two, three days after, it was 1,800. And three days after, it was stabilized there. And I told him, okay, now we can pick. And I compare that to uh, someone who gives you money. You know, he gives you uh, 10 bucks, you wait. Give you 10 bucks, you wait. Again, you wait. And at one point, like the anthocyanin, they, they decrease. If the person is taking you back the money, you leave. You, 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 you don't stay there. So uh, that's the same thing. You, you, when you get to this, this uh, high point and it begins to decrease, it is when it is uh, the best. For aromatically, and also that matches with the type of tannins I like to have in my wines. And uh, all of that works very well when you don't look for over, what I call overripe wines. That is going to give you more sense of freshness, elegancy, and uh, that is going to show the terroir better, in my opinion, and that uh, also these wines are going to be wine that ages a lot. And it is another reason why I love Petit Sira. Petit Sira has a nageability, in my opinion, that is higher than, than even Cabernet. So we have very old vintages coming from very young vines, and they are still very, very alive. So I, I like, the, I like this, uh, this wine for that too. Um, the, the winemaking I use is, I would say, very simple. So uh, it's very traditional. I don't do anything very unusual. The, the control I have on it is very modern. But uh, it's, I don't do uh, cold soaking. I don't. I play with pumping overs. I play with temperature. With a lot of oxygen. Oxygen is the base of uh, of uh, um, fixing color and 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 making the the tannins uh, evolving correctly. And uh, 
I don't do anything else than that, and uh, that is. Uh, um, I, I like again this, the, 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 the fact it is traditional for me is very important, very very important in winemaking. And uh, this year also we did something very interesting. Uh, we did a co-ferment with uh, with uh, Viognier. Uh, they, they were thinking about doing that for years, and this year we had a little bit more Viognier than needed, and we did that. We did we put 10% of Viognier in a petit sirah in two tanks. And the result was really, really extraordinary. The, the florality we got through this, uh, these two tanks was really, really uh, marvelous. And uh, we, we are going to try to do it again because in the, in the final blend it gives something very special. Um, so when I joined um, uh, Staglib, um, I realized that Staglib was kind of a reference in the, in the, in the, um, the world of Petit Syrah, and uh, I tried to understand that. And uh, I think there is two things. First, uh, we make first Petit Syrah from the early 70s, and uh, the... the um, it is going to come back, don't worry. <laughs> And the quantity also. We, we are one of the biggest uh, producer and in, uh, in, in the in, in the Petit producer. Uh, something uh, about the quality of the wines I realized is that we source the fruit from North Napa to South Napa, from Calistoga to uh, almost South Napa, and uh, we can see a huge difference of expression. And it is all Napa, but it is totally different. Uh, Calistoga gives us something, and that, that was surprising for me because Calistoga is meant to produce bigger wines, and it was the, the most refined, floral, elegant Petit Sirah come from Calistoga. And uh, the, the, the thousand you go, uh, um, in Stag's Leap is one, one of them, the, the bolder, the bigger, the more tannins. Uh, I was talking about tannins, I, I measure that with an index. In Calistoga I was getting like 75, in South Napa I can go to 110. So uh, it's, and aromatically can be a bit more austere, but what makes uh, Stag's Leap maybe unique is that we have so many fruit, uh, different growers and, and uh, we source the fruit all along that all these totally different wines, they make something, the result is very very, very complex and maybe unique and uh, that is uh, um, that is usually for Merlot and Cab I do the contrary uh, I am I am already changing some growers to recenter uh, in one part of, of, of the valley to have really a strong identity but the funny thing is the Petit Sira we, we get the strong identity through the diversity of, of terroir we, uh, we, we use and about the story also of uh, of Stag Leap and um, it's when Cardomani uh, bought, bought the, the property, there was there were already a, a, an old block of Petit we, we call it the Noke de Malis block, it is a, a reference to a family who owned the property. And uh, I think that's, what, that's the reason why Carl, seeing this block, started to, to plant more Petit in the property. And this block is really unique. We don't know, honestly, how old is the oldest. Uh, because uh, it has been replaced little by little, but uh, it's very, very old, old, uh, old uh, block. And uh, we don't know also what is the history behind the fact that uh, there is around 82% Petit and mixed is the field blend, there is, uh, the rest of it is made of 15 other varieties. So that's pretty unique. We don't know the story. We don't know why it was so diverse. We don't know why a so old uh, Petit Chira was already there. We don't know where the, the, the vines were coming from. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very unique block. And uh, we, we just love that. We have, um, it's dry farm, it's head train. And uh, the funny thing is there is some um, vines that are so old, they are visually, we can see that they are not doing well. But I, and after, before harvest, we go in the field and we taste individually all the vines that are susceptible not to be good so we spend uh, all day in there and we test at the end of the day uh, we don't want to eat grape anymore it's uh, it's over for the day uh, but uh, we have to do that to be sure to ensure that uh, everything that ev each vine that goes to the to the tank is going to deliver high quality and uh, we have a map of this uh, of this block and every time a, 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 a vine is removed we replace it with the same variety to to follow the, the history of this uh, of this uh, unique block. So it's um, working with Petit Chira has been, has been uh, 
uh, new experience and again being uh, in love with with tannins with big wines with uh, it, it is a, it is a really really great experience and I am very happy to, to work and to be here with you today Before we open it to uh, questions in the room here to Christophe, we have an online question for you. Uh, Christophe, the question uh, comes, uh, what is your process, um, what process do you use for taming the uh, Petite Syrah tannins? Uh, when it, very important. Any any wine making I do, any white reds, whatever the variety, uh, I test, taste every day everything, and decide what I do depending on the testing. So uh, I don't want to hit the wall. That is what uh, what I try to avoid. So testing every day, you can feel in control of what you are doing and follow that very precisely. Um, the main, the major. Difference between Petit Chirac and Cabernet or Merlot is is very dangerous to macerate too long. I think after 10, 12 days, you are, you already have everything you want. Uh, so draining at the right time is very important. Uh, and after that, uh, if I have a touch up, and that the thing is, during harvest, these tannins they, they can seem very very hard because you have the carbonic gas, so they are very young and, and re, um, reactive. But during the aging in, 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 in oak, these tannins, they lost, they, they are still a lot, they, they, but they lose the aggressiveness. So if I need at the end, I, I will do a, a little uh, fining. But honestly, I am surprised of the quality of the tannins we have in the Petit Tira. So, and, and, uh, so we, we drain around 10, 12 days. We are just finishing the fermentation. But last year also, we had, we had the fermentation that was very long, very slow. And we kept uh, one of the tank months, and it was a big, big tannin tanks and at the end it is not more uh, astringent or, or rough than the other ones so I need to investigate a bit more but uh, and that's the thing the, the after 12 days you have plenty of everything already and uh, you drain and so to taste every day it's it's the base of when to decide when when you drain thank you um, I think we do have a few other online questions uh, yeah we have some other questions coming in from the uh, online broadcast um, another question here is uh, barrel usage uh, how much new how much American when you're working with your petite Syrahs at your location that's a very good question because and that uh, I am talking about uh, because of the history before me and uh, it took me a while to accept it without experimenting but I am going to experiment anyway in the future <coughs> but uh, we use in the petit Syrah we use 25% New York and it is only American oak uh, the experience accumulated at Stag's Leap is simple. If you put French oak with Petit Chira, Petit Chira is so strong that it doesn't match correctly. Uh, the, the oak is not uh, visible in a certain way. And this grape that is very spicy, very strong, the American oak that can sometimes overwhelm a very delicate wine is going to be a perfect match. So uh, only 25% and I like that because it is showing more the fruit than the oak. And American oak, it's, uh, it's, it's, it spices in a very fine way the, the Petit Chira. Something about, uh, we do also, uh, what we, the Napa Valley Petit Chira, uh, we, um, we have blenders in that. We, we have uh, around 20% are made of mainly Syrah, but we have more at Carignan. Uh, we have other, other varieties uh, because that helps uh, again to tame. We were talking about tannins, uh, how to manage that. I think it's part of the, the, of the solution is also to give, or to put, uh, there is Grenache also, which is very light in tannins and very aromatic. So uh, these blenders will help also to uh, give us more roundness and softness to the overall tannin in the, in, in the blend. Um, yeah, we're a little ahead of schedule here. If, if anybody has any questions for uh, Christoph or Dan or Clark from their talks, um, just raise your hand and Jose will jog on over and uh, we'll get those questions answered. Okay, I got this. I'll do that one. Um, yeah, I just wonder if you could characterize aromatically and stylistically what you see as the contributions of the Calistoga area versus, you know, just the different places you're bringing fruit from and how you, uh, and what they contribute to the blend. The, the, 
North Calistoga again I have a, it's, it's sometimes it reminds me aromatically some uh, some uh, some syrup it's a lot of floral a lot of violet and a lot of pepper and spices I, I really like that but uh, they are not as concentrated in terms of uh, not concentrated I'm talking of very high concentration already but when you compare with South Napa South Napa you lose a little it's uh, you lose a little the the the, 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 the floral expression in the south but you gain is big boulder is a bit more austere it's a bit more on the on the black fruit than in the floral and, and spices on the north and uh, so what I see also uh, we are stag slip we are in the stag slip district and we have I don't know if there is a lot of uh, stag slip uh, um, winery that the chaotic who have uh, who have uh, um, petit chira. but uh, what we see there it's uh, the most concentrated petit chira I got I got it from this this estate we have and I go to 110 in tannins which is which is huge which is huge and uh, but I see that with uh, in the estate in, in this terroir I see that also for the Cap and the Merlot that's naturally gives it's not only the petit chira, that gives more concentration you have more more polyphenolics globally thanks Um, yeah, you know, my question is, uh, when you stand at the press and you're looking at the press fractions, uh, are you considering that in your uh, tan and makeup? And then the corollary uh, to that is, uh, when you're tasting out in the field, are you looking for resolution of the uh, skin tannins? Um, that is that is a very good question and very interesting because the fact also that we don't macerate a month the petit when you press it after 12 days you don't have this pressy aromatic so uh, aromatically is very rich very powerful you don't you don't, you you wouldn't guess aromatically it is a press wine so that's very usable because of that also um, and, and the quality of tannins you you take a, a press wine of cabernet can be very harsh. Uh, lacking mid palate, it's totally disjointed. The the press wine of the of the petit chira is very big, but you don't have this disjointment. And uh, and I I am going to be uh, honest. I am not going to use it uh, in the in the petit chira. I could, but I have enough tannin for that. But I use uh, that as as a, as a blender as a help for other wines. And that, that's something that hasn't been done before me. But I am going to use a little bit of petit chira in the other in product, just a little. But it is it gives so much and the and the and the, the press wine you just concentrate of that without any fault it's any flows it's really really good press wine really amazing nobody was uh, when we tested we we, we, we grade every of the wines and when we tested that uh, blind nobody nobody guessed it was a press wine aromatically or for the type of tannin uh, I am very straightforward with that. Uh, I uh, until point two bars and the pressing that goes with a free run, and after that uh, it goes press. And uh, even more with the, uh, I, I could I could separate. Uh, I, I I don't have the tanks to do that all the time sometimes. But uh, the result, I can see the result. Maybe I could go even higher in the future. I, as I mentioned, it was my first year, so I need I need to to look for my own little tricks to, to learn them. And uh, but uh, maybe 0.5 would be best. But you know, already at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, you get a huge percentage of your press fraction. So, uh, Okay, we, we have another question, but before that, I'm going to do a, a housekeeping statement, which is a sign of the times. Um, we're actually seeing a buildup of activity about this event on Twitter. And if you're on Twitter here today, you are going to know what I'm talking about. The hashtag we're using is PSLove. That way people can easily capture the conversation coming out of here. So if you are on Twitter today, which I do see some people doing, PSLove is the hashtag. Next question. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, um, was the co-fermentation with Viognier uh, to help with uh, uh, color set because you're only using 25% uh, new oak? Not at all. No, it was really the, the, the because honestly you don't, I, I don't have any problem with color with, with Petit Sierra. <laughs> That's the last of my problem with Petit Sierra. So just aromatic. Just aromatically, and it worked very, very well. Maybe it has, uh, it has uh, fixed better, but uh, again, uh, I, I check my color regularly. I reached some numbers that was above shots uh, with the color of Petit Sierra. It's crazy. 
Usually a very high color for me is 20, 24, and I had not like 45 colors. <laughs> it's not a concern. On the Viognier ad, was that whole cluster or was that destemmed? Is there any whole it cluster was destemmed. in destemmed? It was destemmed, yeah. Totally. And I was a little uh, concerned because it's difficult to have uh, at the same time with, with, with the vineyard we have anyway, to have at the same time uh, the, the Petit Chura ready and, and the Viognier ready. So uh, the Viognier was what I would say uh, a little overripe, so I was a little concerned about that, but it worked very well. It worked very, very well. Hi. Uh, I've got a question that goes back to some of the earlier discussions and presentations. Um, I'm very impressed by the work that seems to be being done by, by Clark and folks on um, sort of making up official des uh, uh, specifications for, for the wines and I can see uh, a lot of value in then taking that to the uh, competitions and I appreciate what Dan was saying as well but uh, about his competition and, and the way that's being run and the expertise of the judges so my question though then ties that back in with the things that Tyler was saying this morning and I'm wondering what is being done um, either at Appalachian America or with the particular wine competitions again to address some of the concerns maybe the gentleman from, from Clayhouse had with regard to publicizing this stuff. I mean if you, uh, it takes a lot of work to put together that content and the, and the specifications but if it's hidden behind a paywall you know millennials are not gonna, gonna go there nobody's gonna see it and there are you know scores if not hundreds of wine competitions in the country and if only the, the ones that, that Dan runs you know with relevance to Petit Syrah are sort of doing things the right way how do you rise above the noise so that people know that when they see you know the metal on the clay house bottle that it's been yeah. it's coming from a competition that is really rigorous and, and the results are good rather than you know gosh this was a yummy wine so it's a, a quadruple goal. I'd like to start, I don't think I've got this on. Can you turn it on? Okay. Let me make a Go ahead, go ahead. You know, uh, this is an experiment. This whole idea didn't exist a year ago. And so what we've done in these two competitions was to try it out and see whether or not it made sense and to try to get the major bugs out of it. And so we did not make the commitment to, uh, to, to going online with the results, partly because there are a lot of technical challenges that I think Dan can talk about. Uh